And welcome back once again to uh, Loveless Will Tear Us Apart. Uh, I'm uh, your co-host, uh, John Martinek. And I am Andreas Fabiolakis, the other co-host. So that, that, that makes you a co-host instead of a host. So, I mean, that, that's kind of how that works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we thank you guys so much for your patience in, uh, in sticking it out with us, waiting for us to get uh, the, new, uh, the next episode done. Uh, as you can all remember... If you can remember that far back, uh, we did Beatles versus Beatles, and uh, I believe uh, the winner was uh, Sergeant Peppers, which was I, th I thought uh, was pretty much how it was going to go, just based on um, I guess significance and stuff like that. So uh, when people uh, don't really talk much about the Beatles or just have like a passing thing, uh, White Album doesn't really pop up to them much it's always sergeant mm -hmm. peppers or like um the Revolver collections the anthology and all that kind yeah. of stuff right so but when you really listen to them y'all know anyway let's let's not go down that route i'm just salty <laughs> so uh say la vie. so um this one's gonna be a, a little bit of a departure uh from uh the first uh first battle uh we decided to go a little bit, uh, I guess, darker uh, is like uh, the best way to describe it all. Um, I've been tasked with uh, talking about um, one of the, uh, I wouldn't say best selling, like it's the numbers for sales for both of these albums are not uh, not in the millions. Uh, so we're not going to be delusional here, um, but it's considered uh, one of the most uh, important metal albums of the 90s. Uh, and no, it's not uh, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion, or anything like that. Uh, it's actually uh, Emperor's can Pest de Resistance uh, in the Nightside Eclipse. Yeah, and I'm going the uh, not next door neighbor uh, in terms of metal genres. Uh, so um, Emperor's known for black metal, and I'm going to go towards the death metal route with um, appropriately named band Death and their iconic 90s album Symbolic. So this is going to be uh, a series of, this is going to be a battle between two cacophonous, beautiful albums. Um, you know, you could say that they're both metal albums, but uh, the comparison's a little bit more intricate than that. So if that's what your guess is, you're going to have to be a little bit more precise there's a theme between these two bands and what they achieved on both of these albums. But that's for you to find out. What we're going to discuss is which of these two is worth taking that trophy in terms of the best album of this battle. So um, first off, this was one that I kind of picked, and I apologize, John. These, uh, you know, you, you brought up that you're into some heavier music. But typically when people say that, they might mean Slayer at most, um, Metallica. Some people are into Ministry. Tossing Emperor or Death isn't really everyone's forte. It's not, it's, not their, it's not their cup of tea, but I appreciate this is actually why the episode took so long. John was like like rocking back and forth in, his, in the corner of the room like, oh my god, how am I going to listen to these? But uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I appreciate that you uh, you took this one on the chin, um, especially because these are neither of these bands are ones that you listen to. So, first off, how was that experience? What was that like? Uh, well, I, I gotta tell you when I when I uh, I listened to uh, the Emperor album, and I, I've listened to it, uh, I, I guess less than ten times, uh, just to kind of really still a lot. Uh, well, you know, uh, I think they deserve the deserve the the pennies that they're getting from uh, from Spotify. Yeah. Um, first time I heard it, um, hmm, I was I was really kind of thinking to myself, uh, what the hell did I get myself into? Uh, <laughs> and yeah, like I, I listened to I would I would say I listened to or have listened to uh, heavy tunes uh this uh something different than what i'm used to and and uh like it's 
the upon like listening to it several times, I found that uh, there are a couple songs that stuck out to me that I really really liked, and then after a while, um, and I I mean no disservice to any fans of these albums whatsoever, but uh, in some cases I kind of found like at least on one or two occasions, uh, it sounded kind of poppy if if <laughs> if i can use that in well, describing this is what's the album. really strange about metal i agree and i don't mean in general with like the symphonic elements there's this huge disconnect between metal and other genres but unless you're listening and i don't know if this is going to make any sense unless you're listening to like really avant-garde stuff or technical stuff like origin where it's like just completely like you know a speed related thing mm-hmm. or again avant-garde like Despel omega um you're gonna find a lot of i you know dare i say poppy elements that was kind of like the bridge for me when i got into metal at, in high school because i listen to everything now but you know metal still holds a huge place in my heart but that's why a lot of high schoolers back in my day did like stuff not on corn especially because of their poppy elements or now you have uh, a lot of crossover bands like Death Heaven, who's um, releasing their album, Infinite Granite, uh, August 20th, which is completely shoegaze. They've abandoned the black metal stuff entirely almost. Yeah. But that's why there is that crossover, because if you look at it, a lot of metal, um, you look at black metal, let's say, if there's not an odd time signature, it's 4-4. And even though they're playing fast, it's what they're doing within the bars that you could say, well, that's a scale. Yeah. That's that's rhythmic. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of crossover elements between pop music and metal, which I know is going to piss off a lot of people, but there are. Like, if you listen to Death and Chuck Schuldiner, sorry, Chuck Schuldiner, I can't pronounce his name today. What the fuck? <laughs> okay. Chuck Schuldiner, what he was doing, and he wanted to write off a lot of the a lot of the uh, taboo surrounding death metal when he kind of helped invent it. Um, he, he was like wearing, you know, tourist cat t-shirts and everything. Just wanted to make music. You're, unless you're looking at some extreme examples that are very cacophonous. And, you know, you could even look at like the punk influenced hardcore stuff like Converge for that stuff. Mm-hmm. Most metal has a lot of similarities with pop music. And it's not because it's pop music, but so does rock music so does rap so does electronic music it's yeah. these overall elements so i don't think that's such a weird thing to say in general because a lot of conventional music or just human-made music over the years are rooted in something so if you look at a lot of like extreme metal musicians a lot of them would say oh i love acdc or i love led zeppelin which aren't the heaviest band on earth. Not now, not anymore. No. At the time they came out, maybe, but, um, you know, and Led Zeppelin's, uh, well, they're not influenced by the blues. They basically stole it. But anyway, uh, they basically stole that stuff. And uh, uh, ACDC is very formulaic, not in a bad way, but, you know, they, they've got their they've got their blueprint. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's a lot of crossover, which uh, people want to dismiss in metal, but I hate to say it, metalheads, as somebody who listens to everything, there's catchiness in metal, even in the extreme mm-hmm. stuff. It just, it's there. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And that's I think that's part of it. I think it all comes down to the hook, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, the hook, the riff, uh, whatever it is, like what separates the synth lead in like a bad romance or something – Mm-hmm. than something that you would find outside of the time signature in a Meshuga song. It's still that hook, that repetitive hook that keeps you in. And yeah. even though they're doing different things in different styles, and in this case, different time signatures, it's still the hook. It's the idea that you're meant to be lured in by a hook. So again, unless you're like completely avant-garde or um, jazz-based, um, a lot of metal... Mm-hmm. It's hooky. It is. And, you know, even stuff like Cannibal Corpse is based on hooks. And, yeah. you know, you can't deny it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, like, for myself, when I was going back to what we were talking before about listening to, like, heavier stuff, like, I think for me, uh, when it came to metal, I think, like, the heaviest thing I was, like, 
really digging at that point in time was um, was uh, Sun. Oh, that's, um, that's really heavy, though. Yeah. I was, I was expecting, like, yeah, like Metallica, but if Sun... Sun some good shit. Oh, it's a uh, in, in particular is the the Sun and uh, Scott Walker album. Oh yes, rest, so, rest in peace. Yeah, which was just, I mean, I I love uh, Scott Walker. Anyways, I know like it's uh, for him it was always about experimenting stuff, but mm-hmm. hearing that album for the first time, I was just like, holy shit! It's like a Titanic it's experience. So good, and yeah. I'm like, I wish they could do more. And unfortunately, you know, I mean now that he's no longer with us uh, it's impossible uh but it was just like one of those things where you're going like well scott walker with son like how does that how does that work and the answer is it worked perfectly mm-hmm. <laughs> um but going back to going back to these albums the death album didn't really listen to it i was so focused on just making sure i had a strong enough argument uh for emperor that i didn't really want to like uh, sidetrack myself with any other information uh, and and maybe accidentally falling in love with your album and then making uh, the uphill climb for me to say <laughs> this album is the best, uh, more difficult. Um, but uh, in, in any case, uh, let's, let's get her started. Uh, we'll go alphabetical, uh, so you get to go first. <laughs> Just barely. D, D, like, right before E, I guess. <laughs> so, um, okay, so uh, let's give a little bit of history on Death. So Death was the major project of, uh, again, Chuck Schuldiner, uh, rest in peace. Uh, he passed away, I think it's like 20, yeah, wow, it's been 20 years. Uh, 20 years since December. So uh, a, a tragic case, he died at the young age of 34, uh, he had uh, reoccurring ca- uh, battles with cancer. One of the earliest uh, in the internet age, one of the earliest cases of uh, crowdfunding, especially for uh, metal musicians so they could survive. And uh, beat, beat his first cancel or be, beat his ber- beat his first battle with cancer. And uh, they had all these charity shows and everything. Um, they came back and unfortunately the American system when it comes to healthcare, it's unforgiving. Uh, he was good for the money the first time. They didn't care. Rest in peace. But let's go back to his legacy. Now, uh, Chuck was both the uh, songwriter, vocalist, and guitarist. And his uh, his guitar playing was like monumental in the in the genre of death metal, uh, especially because he's often he's often been crowned as like the creator of death metal. Hence, why it's called death metal. Uh, because the band's called Death. Now, when they first started, um, they've had like a pretty, uh, a pretty varied career in terms of like what their sounds were. So, Death started uh, in the late '80s. Uh, the first album was a Scream Buddy Gore, and that was like straight up, you know, talking about like typical death metal, death metal topics like you know, the zombie stuff, uh, blood and guts, that sort of stuff. It was very crisp, a uh, nice. Uh, just a sub 40 minute duration. Leprosy is not that much different spiritual healing, but it's around the time of human in 1991 that it got a little bit more, a little bit more technical, a little bit more, not experimental, but adventurous. Let's say it's not like he veered outside of death metal, but he, um, he wanted to explore what they could really do as opposed to just discussing political things or um, again, blood and guts and stuff. So, uh, on that album, he teamed up with uh, two brilliant members of, of the um, the progressive metal band Cynic. So, you know, you have uh, Paul Masvidal on guitars and uh, rest in peace, Sean Reinhardt on drums. Um, and that's, that's where it really started. After that, Chuck was all about trying to push the limits of, of death metal. So individual thought patterns came afterwards. The album we're going to discuss very soon. And the last album was The Sound of Perseverance. So, you know, he worked with a lot of huge prominent figures in the metal scene, like the two Cynic members I mentioned, but also um, Gene Hoagland, who's one of the greatest metal drummers of all time, Richard Christie, who's a fantastic drummer, but you might recognize him off the Howard Stern show. Right. Pretty big departure there, but uh, he's still a phenomenal drummer. Nonetheless, uh, he was working with, like, a lot of bigs. And, yeah, the penultimate album was uh, symbolic, where 
ever since human again trying to see how far he could go so with symbolic i feel like this was his his opportunity to try and check out melody so this is pretty different from you know the band that started off trying to be like again all about zombies speaking about politics now it's like you know, that progressive influence that, you know, the members of Cynic or Gene Hoagland might have brought in. And um, he, he's focusing on, on bigger things here. So that kind of sets the stage for this particular album. This is one of many experiments and, in my opinion, potentially the best, if not very, uh, like, neck and neck with humans. So that's, uh, that's symbolic. What about in the Nighttide Eclipse? Oh, okay. Uh, so let's uh, go with uh, with the start of Emperor here. Now, um, it, the band itself was was kind of like, hmm. They they basically became Emperor in like ninety one, uh, but uh, the, uh, two of the members, uh, Isan and uh, Sanath, actually met each other in the early like. Uh, when they were like young, uh, and then they basically uh, they basically tried out different band names and they tried to I guess get their footing as to what they were looking to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, they 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 kept working at it and everything kind of started falling into place when they got Mortis uh, in as their bass player. Uh, that's when they basically formed uh, formed Emperor. Um, they put out a couple of demos, um, and uh, that's about as I guess as lighthearted as it gets. Because um, if anybody knows anything about Norwegians and metal, and black metal uh, yeah. especially in the early nineties, uh, it's uh, it's fucking nuts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of like rebelling against against what they feel to be like this this state that doesn't understand them, doesn't get them, it's, and it's betraying their their beliefs and their thoughts about what it's like to be a Norwegian, you know, before they were corrupted by by Christianity uh, and all that sort of thing. So, uh, which resulted in a lot of unfortunately a lot of like a church bur- uh, church burnings, um, mm-hmm. other. Uh, crazy crimes if you want to read one of the craziest things uh in in the history of music ever look up the uh, the biography for mayhem uh which is uh insanely fucked up but mm-hmm. uh anyways back to emperor which is a little fucked up but not nearly as screwed up as them uh, they would actually kind of and it's funny that you do bring up mayhem because uh when uh emperor is going on and stuff uh, they 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 need one more person to join the band because I mean you you had two guitarists and a drummer uh, and a bassist uh, so they got a drummer and the drummer's name was Faust. Oh, uh, speaking and... of musicians that have killed people, I mean, sorry. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, so, like in their early nineties, ninety two, uh, they're kind of going like on like a, a burning streak. Uh, you could say they're on fire, uh, and they're basically kind of going around and and setting fire to old churches and stuff. Is like a, this is this is Viking land. Get the fuck out of here, mm-hmm. uh, as youths will do when they're feeling rebellious and stuff like. It's like bring down the machine, do this, do that. Um, in the meantime, what happened was that uh, while he was living in Lilleheimer. Uh, the way Faust explains it is that he was going through the Olympic Park and a man walked up to him and uh, said, hey, would you like to go for a walk? And Faust is like, okay, cool, like I'm gonna score some drugs or something. Uh, what ended up happening is the way Faust says it, that the man became sexually aggressive towards him uh, and he felt he had no choice but to defend himself by stabbing the man, uh, I think, over 30 times, uh, and then kicking him in the head in the face uh, while he was bleeding on the ground 
just to make sure he was dead. And I think that's a pretty defensive, like, stand. Um, of course, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, I don't think he... Uh, I don't think he was defensive at all. I think he was just... He went for a walk with this guy, and that was it. Uh, people would say that maybe he was uh, was into gay bashing, uh, or that he was a homophobe, uh, which is actually kind of far from the truth as well, because even though this happened uh, while he was in prison and outside of prison, uh, I can't, can't remember who the name of the musician was. Oh, but I know, I know who you're thinking of. There you're was thinking. a there was a, mu- a musician. You're thinking of of Gall of. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. A Gall, who's an openly gay musician, uh, and came in, out. In and, Ross. Yeah. Yeah, he came out uh, as gay, and Faust was the first of that group of people to be like, "I stand by him. I support him a hundred percent." Which, if you think uh, coming out as gay in hip hop is bad. Uh, coming yeah. out as gay in, in extreme metals, particularly black metal, is because uh, unfortunately um, there are sectors of black metal that are that are, um, that are white supremacist and uh, very very um, very fucked. Let's just say, but we yeah. don't need to go into that today. But basically, no. uh, yeah, uh, God, the lead singer of Gorgoroth is like the first open case of that. I think. Yeah. So after he had committed the murder, he basically hung out with uh Euronymous and Varg uh, of Burzum. Basically go do some like church burnings and stuff. Of of mayhem, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Varg did Burzum later on, but yeah, uh yeah. Of mayhem, uh, yes. and then uh when the investigation into uh the murder of Euronymous was taking place, uh everything kinda got leaked out and Faust was uh then f- arrested. Uh, but he was, uh, he was, I think he was supposed to be in prison for 20 years and he got out after 14. Um, for, I guess they kind of like lowered the sentence because he was upstanding. Uh, but that's basically kind of the band starting off. Um, and in this time, uh, they released for, from the time they started off up until uh, in the Nightside Eclipse. They released, I think, about three or four demos, yeah. uh, EPs, and then they went fucking balls out uh, with uh, In the Nightside Eclipse, uh, yeah. which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I should also note that uh, Mortis had left uh, the band by the time they had left, and they uh, actually went ahead and uh, recruited another bassist by the name of, uh, uh, forgive me if I pronounced his name, uh, Short? To, to court? Short? I, I, I actually don't know. Uh, the only person whose name I'm comfortable pronouncing is Ishan. Which, you know, <laughs> but it. that was basically it. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the lead up to this behemoth of an album. Um, so back to you. Well, I don't know how to follow that up. No. Uh, so <laughs> what's 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 going on in uh, on the glorious album Symbolic? So. Symbolic has gone on to, to receive a ton of critical acclaim. Uh, some some people consider it death's opus, and it's it's not hard to see why. Uh, you have a couple of really fantastic tracks, like the the banger of the opener, um, "Empty Words" was like a really like a really coveted song upon release, and even now. But the most um, the most popular song I find is Crystal Mountain, which feels like this this guitar-driven journey down this path, you know, up the titular mountain. But otherwise, every single song is clad with hooks. This is what we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Clad with hooks. Um, incredible melodic guitar leads and soloing by, by Chuck. Again, rest in peace. But a lot of uh, really interesting lyricism on here as well. Not to say that death wasn't interesting beforehand, but um, here there's all sorts of like fantastic subject matter, some often political or like descriptive and narrative in nature. But um, I feel like what could have been massive for death was that uh, this particular album was released on Roadrunner, which Roadrunner 
was on the verge of becoming this massive label that it would eventually become signing, you know, Slipknot and Nickelback. But still, Roadrunner in the in the mid nineties was it was a home run. So it's it's no secret as to how this could have had such a reach, especially with um, with tracks like Crystal Mountain. So um, it's it's a nice lean fifty minute album. Uh, it's not too short. It's also not too long. There's absolutely no filler. But there's a lot of again like melodic aspects. Not to drive that point into the ground, but like the way, for instance, Empty Words opens almost like almost ambiently with like this this breathing room after zero tolerance and then it just goes bam right into the song but each song has like these these movements they're not like direct the shortest the, the shortest song you're going to find here is like four and a half minutes longest eight and a half so all of these songs go down these the these myri- these handfuls of different paths but they always resort right back to the start or exactly where they're supposed to go. They don't meander too far. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge testament to what Chuck Schuldiner was like as not just a lyricist, but also a songwriter. And that's, what's really interesting about death because I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of copycat bands or uh, death influenced death metal bands might try to follow the complexity or the, uh, the intensity of the genre, but on this type of an album, it's the exploration that makes it really special where you feel like you've listened to like 10 different songs, but all of them were like amazing in the span of like six minutes. And um, yeah, each, each riff isn't a riff. Each riff is a separate song smushed together into this compilation of, of brilliance and, and nine tracks Again, not a single dull moment. So, um, again, I, I love Symbolic. What's it like with uh, in the Nightside Eclipse over there? Uh, wow. So, to go with the album itself, um, the way they, the way the album has been critically received has been um, uh, loved, really. And it's it's odd to like hear that about something and i'm going to assume here that a lot of people listening to this haven't really given much uh thought or have ever really listened to death or black metal uh at all um <clears throat> the bad, thing with, <laughs> with uh with uh in the nightside eclipse the thing that people need to understand is that when they're listening to it they're going like okay so it's it's heavy there's a lot of chorus of singers. There's a, lo- there's a lot of like symphonic effects to it and everything. That was something that was not even considered to be doable or would be considered to be uh, black metal at all. It was the first album to kind of really push that and kind of like meld uh, meld those two things into the music. Uh, so when we were talking before about how it's easy to kind of like you look and and say well you know like this could be considered like poppy or this could be considered this because everybody borrows from everything um the fact that they just they decided that they could do just a straight black metal album and i think in their minds they probably thought this is this is straight black metal but the incorporation of, of using like strings and just like the opening of, of the album alone, like is just so fucking just um, and for and for like reference sake, the version I listened to was the remastered version. Mm-hmm. Um, so what they had done with that is that uh, they combined the first two songs, which are a intro and into the infinity of thoughts and combine them to into one song and then they added two other songs on there uh, a bathory and a merciful fate cover mm-hmm. um shortest song would be the merciful fate cover which is just under three minutes uh again not really uh not really a black metal thing <laughs> uh the longest uh would actually be uh the combined uh, intro and into the infinity of thoughts which just clocks in just over nine minutes 
Uh, so if we want to be particular here, um, uh, Eclipse has uh, Eclipse uh, Emperor um, has uh, has the winning edge so far because they have the longer song on the album. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Everything counts. I'm trying to I'm trying to stretch it out here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, um, one thing I'll say, and I uh, I did pick both of these albums because I um I adore both of these. These are both in like my top ten metal albums of all time. Mm -hmm. Um, Death and Symbolic are like very pristine sounding. Like you can hear the guitars ring and the each individual tom or bass drum hits, but emperor in, in the night side eclipse on this album it's like this gargantuan wall of sound not that it's muddy but it's like this oh. yeah this dense vibe and that's what i love about black metal um black metal is very much uh, a lot of it was done with like very crappy recordings but that mm -hmm. doesn't matter because it's it's about this unattainable unattainable sound where you can't really describe what you're listening to outside of just pure blissful noise so that's why stuff like like early dark throne it's just like or it's not or it's not early dark throne let me re, let me redo that and that's why you, something like another one of my favorite albums um transylvanian hunger by by dark throne is like so poorly recorded but that doesn't matter it's it's just gorgeously noisy and yeah. in this instance it's not that it's poorly recorded but they keep that that indescribable, you know, inability to, to separate instruments. Yeah. But shoving symphonic stuff as well. So you've got this again, this this impossible to label, especially back then. Yeah. Um, you know, series of sounds that just bleed into bleed in one another. So mm -hmm. one's a very well produced album with separating the instruments. And then you've got something like this where they all just kind of converge. Yeah. It's, I would, I would say, uh, without really making a joke, uh, without really joking, it would be like if Phil Spector decided to start wearing corpse paint. That's Which, uh, production on this. not to get too chest. dark, but Phil Spector's also like very fitting considering he killed someone. But anyway, yeah. Let's... <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, and it's it's just that denseness, and it's you'd be hard pressed to find something that just it's it's not just denseness, but like we're saying, it's like when 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 this the symphony parts come in, you're going like, what the fuck? Like the fact that they're this young, and they're just they just have these ideas, and the album itself is influenced by like four different like things in regards to like what they do with their specifically for their lyrics uh obviously vikings uh, which is kind of like a mainstay for for a lot for of bands metal, back then yeah. thanks to bathory uh, you know or, or thanks to bathory yes yep tolkien oh yeah uh dracula and all things relating to transylvania and just like dark european folklore so it's it's not so much the oh the bloody hands of the zombies are coming to get you and stuff but it's just it's so and i would say at least on in one occasion uh cosmic horror and it's not something i w would have expected to get from listening to this album again uh being the first times i ever listened to it i would have never i would have just assumed it was going to be about oh, la, 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 la. Uh, oh, like I love Satan, and, and you know. Yeah, uh, and I mean they. It's, uh, no, they, it's they, more nuanced. Yeah, and they do have like they have uh, it's uh, Inno a Satana, uh, which is Italian for him to Satan, mm -hmm. which was the original album closer until like on the the original album. Um, but that's basically it. Like they all, they're all sharing duties in regards to writing the songs. Uh, as far as like one, two, three, four of four of the song uh, of the nine songs on the album, uh, lyrics for the uh, the songs are written by Samoth. Uh, one, two, three, four of them are written by is Isan, and one two are written by Mortis. So there's a little bit of overlap there with, with who's doing the lyrics, but they're all contributing to this. They're all going, 
I really, I kind of like this. I want to, I want I think we can, we can bring this into our sound or we can talk about this and communicate that and just like show people like how fucking cool this stuff is. Um, so it's, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, uh, the album got released in 94. Uh, it was recorded in 93. Uh, and, uh, well, like I've said before, it's uh, it's uh, the first album to fuse black metal and symphonic elements. Uh, it's considered, I think, it's got like a five star rating on uh, on uh, all music. It's uh, it, a lot of critics praised it because they were just looking at it saying, like, look, you know, if you listen to black metal, you know how black metal is supposed to be. This is how it's meant to be. This is just pure, like they've 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 really just proven proven uh, <clears throat> that you can work within a maelstrom of like sound and still be able to like hook you in with that and like hearing the music in there and kind of getting wrapped up in it. And like after the first couple times of listening to it, I I would lose track of which song I was on, and then be like, "Damn it, the album's over." Uh, well, that's a that's a good sign, I would say, because that yeah. could be a problem. But in this case, for no. me, it's a good problem to have, where you're just like you're taken away. You're not you're not like counting the seconds or t- or keeping track of the of the list. You know. Yeah. Um, so my my impressions of the album are. Um, so uh, again, going based off of the limited like amount of of like black metal that i had listened to and a lot of the uh i mean <laughs> this sounds ridiculous but like my my exposure to like like darker or heavier metal has been like two things it was one as uh metalocalypse which yeah their references to stuff like this is, is pretty good like black or um, or death metal yeah, and the other one is uh, Detroit Metal City, uh, which is a oh. <laughs> Japanese uh, manga slash anime slash live action movie about a man who uh, moves to the big city because he wants to be a pop star, pop star, and gets sucked into the to the realm of like black metal, and he's forced to sing lead for a band called. Detroit Metal City, and uh, it's great because he's he hates himself because he's getting all this popularity. People adore him and everything because he's this character. But uh, the flip side, when he wants to do the music he wants to do, everybody hates it. So he's like stuck. Like he has the success, but he has the success doing something he absolutely hates and scares him. So that was, like, what my kind of, like, intro to all this stuff was. Um, the album, I think when I first heard intro, I was a bit concerned because uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to be listening to or what was going on. Uh, I then uh, Infinity of Thoughts just, like, fucking goes, goes for it right off the bat. And you're like, oh, shit, what is Andreas doing me? <laughs> and then after that it was just it was just it was basically an onslaught of sound yeah. uh, and it's just it, it to the the infinity of thoughts is is like it's just a firestorm of like new sound it's just crazy good uh, I've I I can tell you that out of the album itself uh, I have like a favorite on there and and uh, one that I'm not fussy on. So the one I'm not fussy on is actually the the cover of uh, cover of Gypsy, which we can uh, exclude if you're looking at like the original track list, right? So yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to include it in there because I think it's only fair to say like okay. if you're if you're loving the album, uh, you may want to go with you may want to go with the original, and not the remastered. Yeah. If you want to give the remastered a try, go ahead and do so. Gypsy's the last song on the album, uh, and it's it's not that great. Uh, the best song I, I think on the album is um, 
cosmic keys to my creations and times. Oh, that's it's, interesting because like the most popular example is I am the Black Wizard. So, like that's yeah. like, one of their most popular songs for sure. Mm-hmm. So hearing cosmic keys, that makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, oddly enough, it's uh, one of the two songs written by by Mortis uh, before he went off to go and get Mortis launched his own band. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's 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 I just I just I just love it. It's 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 really really good. Uh, the whole album, top to bottom, is like I said. Out if you exclude Gypsy, everything on there is like fucking top notch. Uh, it's great. Uh, you might find uh, you might find it a bit difficult to adjust to uh, the constant chorus of voices. Uh, and this, the symphonic elements, but really, when you, if you put it up against another black metal album or anything that came out around that time and com- like compare the two, this is in a different different league. It's it's hugely influential to the to the second wave of, of black metal, uh, and you would think it would be some of the other stuff, but a lot of people just name drop this album and say. Like I wouldn't have gotten into this, or I wouldn't have looked into or tried to experiment with like heavier stuff if it wasn't for this album. Which again, when you you look at it from like what they did, how they were able to accomplish it with like not having like millions of dollars to like fuck around in the studio mm-hmm. and just do it, they knew what they want, the sound they wanted. It's the sound of impending doom. And it's 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 fan fucking fantastic. I, I, I can't. Uh, I think um, it's definitely it's grown on me. Uh, and I'm going to say to that uh, when I look at albums like that from now on, like they all have to either uh, specifically in anything uh, going forward that's going to be heavy. It's got to compare with this. And if it doesn't, then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it the, the, the time of day because. This is just, uh, it turned me into a believer of, well, not so much of, of burning down churches. Well, no, uh, <laughs> we, we, we but, don't condone that. No, uh, I mean, there are various reasons to do so, but uh, overall, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just fucking awesome. Yeah, that's the thing about both of these albums. I think, uh, What's really special about them is they took two genres where there is a lot of stubbornness, where it's like death metal has to be like you know this this uh, this many beats per minute. It's got to sound like this. The like, lyrical content's got to be like this. And Symbolic was like, no, let's meet, let's venture forth, let's discover new avenues, let's get out of our comfort zones without like completely jumping the shark. Then you have in the Nights at Eclipse, where it's like uh, black metal's got to be like recorded like this, uh, completely against the norm. And on their debut, Ishan and company were just like, we don't give a shit. We're going to do it like this. And that's why I always found it very, very, like, kind of hilarious when people would would crap on, like, Knock Mistium or um, Lethargy or. Again, in modern times, Death Evan for kind of like veering off the rails of black metal and trying to merge them with other genres. And it's like even some of the greats of the genre. So if you're looking at like Dark Throne or um, or Gorgoroth or Leviathan, hell, even like Leviathan has some like really melodic moments, but like emperor who, who put out one of the best albums of that genre mm-hmm. yeah they weren't limiting themselves like if you want like the greatest straightforward black metal album as it was meant to be heard you're gonna put on transylvania hunger but if you want to hear what people pushing themselves past convention sound like without again jumping the shark or, or selling out then you've got in the nightside eclipse where they found noise and harmony and beauty and noise. Like it's both albums I think are fantastic for opening up your mind as to what metal can sound like. And to me, they're, they're not, they're not only the gateway albums into metal for people who aren't into the extreme stuff, 
but they're also the reverse. If you're only into extreme stuff, they kind of get you thinking about other stuff. And I like that. Yeah, exactly. Where do we go from here? <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, I don't know what else I could possibly add uh, to talk uh, to 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 uh, go further with with whatever we discuss. Uh, it's um, I think both albums uh, and like I said, I, I'm, I'm really gonna give uh, give the uh, give death a, a more of a listen. Like I said, I just didn't want to throw myself off and. Uh, because uh, you, you knew it was better, though. I mean, you uh, were listening to it, and you were like, "Okay, I love Emperor, but this shit's this shit's really good. I gotta, I got I gotta stop now. I gotta stop before I change my mind." No, yeah, yeah I, exactly. I personally don't actually have a preference, but secretly for this battle, it's death. It's a deadly bet. So, uh, <laughs> you gotta vote for Chuck. Chuck Chuck was an innovator. Like Ishan was 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 all right at guitar, but Chuck was the best. I mean. No. You know what? And I can, I can, I can see that, and I can, I can agree with that. And what I'd like to say too with this is that uh, death, that album, based off of what you said, sounds like it's more like one guy's leading it, the other guys are kind of going along with. Well, it. that was the band in general. Like he had like some core members, but it was it was really a Chuck, a Chuck project at heart, and. Anybody who performed with him, they didn't leave because he was intolerable to work with. He just made friends with everyone, and yeah. he just decided who he wanted to record with at which time. So he heard Cynic and was like, "Hey, I want to make some jams with those guys." You yeah. know, he heard some stuff that Gene Hoagland was doing. Was like, "Hey, let's have him on the next Death album." Like yeah. it was just about trying to push metal with some of, you know, each new graduating member of the metal class. Yeah. Whereas. Um, yeah, Emperor's had some lineup switches as well, but it was a little bit more about like it being a band as opposed yep. to you know um, yep. one man's uh, project with with whoever he could bring on board. So exactly, and I, I look at it and I, th I think that's what I think endears the album a bit more is the fact that it's a it's everybody putting into it. It's not like a it's not like the Cure where it's like, hey, everybody gets to have a say. But like Robert Smith is the the, the person who'll say, okay, no, actually we're not gonna do that at all. It's like everybody has a say here, and everything fucking gets tossed in. Mm -hmm. And again, like when you're when you're looking at the outputs of these two bands, this is the first Emperor album, the first album. It's like it's it's just it's just, and I mean they did other stuff afterwards but i mean like what a fucking debut honestly like it is uh just the fact that they were able to do this with what they had uh and everybody like saying this is how we're gonna make this work and they made it work and and turn out the way it is i mean i think it's i mean no offense to death i i don't think it's any contest at all when you look at it just well you could say that or you could look at how how a band ends their career so uh... you can see like you can see the progression you can see the progression that they had and i know that symbolic's the second last album but sound of perseverance isn't that far behind either but um how did how did he mature because i love emperor but they didn't exactly get close to in the nighttime eclipse ever again despite the oh. fact that the other three albums are great mm -hmm. death got better and uh, Chuck's vision got better. So, also, it's not on the album, but if you want to talk about good covers, um, Death's cover of Painkiller by Judas Priest, it's going to be a lot better than Unmerciful Fate cover, just saying. Just saying. Okay. All <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't really toss that out there because, I mean, Priest rocks anyways. And uh, I don't think I've ever heard a bad Priest cover in my life. Well, then, uh, you know... Um, not off the record because we're on the air, but uh, <laughs> worth checking out. Uh, you know, distance from this battle, you should check out that one. It's it's one of the best priest covers, and I do sincerely mean that. Plus, to hear Chuck actually doing like falsetto, screamy vocals as opposed to his usual growling, yeah, worth, worth the ticket of admission, even though it's free. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So uh, there you guys have it. 
uh, death, emperor, uh, it's your choice. Um, so we'll be doing this the same way we did last time, uh, which is uh, getting this posted up on YouTube uh, for your listening pleasure. Um, and then you guys can head over uh, to anti-social media. Uh, where you'll see uh, the Loveless Will Tear Us Apart section. The poll will be up there for you to vote on which album um, you feel is the best one. And uh, I would also say that don't just limit yourself to what we've said here. Give, give these albums a listen. I think that's something that's always been important for me uh, with, with the battles that I've always had is that it's one thing to talk about this stuff and say, okay, this is this of uh, uh, my expert listening opinion is this blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> uh, is all fine. But in the grand scheme of things, you, the best way to like tell yourself or figure out which one's better, listen to them. And if you've listened to these albums countless times before and you love them, give them another listen. Like, honestly, it's, it, could think of worse things to do uh and yeah vote and we'll have um we'll have the results up uh by the time the next uh next podcast comes up uh and not to kind of like spoil anything uh, we already have the the next one kind of queued up as to what we're going to be doing uh unfortunately it's not going to be this part two <laughs> uh it's going to be something decidedly different. And I think I, what I appreciate about this is that uh, we're kind of bouncing all over the place in regards to what we're doing, what's what's going on, and like what's being chosen to be to be debated about. Much I mean, easier albums to listen to. Just, just yeah. going to let you know. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to put you to sleep. Um, but I, I do have to say both albums are, are pretty are pretty fucking solid, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm I, I think I have my work cut out for me because uh, Andres ended up taking the album that I absolutely think is like, um, honestly, I, I would probably say it's the better album of the two, but I haven't I haven't I really need to give my album. Um, a really serious uh, go over and I think from uh, what makes it interesting with the one coming up is that I love both albums uh, the one of them more so uh, but the album that I love a lot of people not liking uh, I'm getting a, I've been hearing a lot of negative feedback online about it uh, a lot of people just not digging uh, the sound uh, or what's being uh, try, trying to be accomplished with the album uh, I find it uh, I find it really interesting because I think it's really, really great, but uh, that's my own personal taste, and I mean, hell, uh, I, I love Howard Jones. <laughs> so, so take it for what you will. Uh, but it should be awesome. It's going to be awesome because it's music, and it's something that we all love um, to various degrees, and it, it should be awesome. So, uh, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add, Andreas, before we uh, wrap this up i just want to say that battle is the first one that wasn't decided by uh by john and myself so this is uh one of your recommendations out there so uh we're we're listening to stuff that we're unfamiliar with or uh reassessing stuff that we already know uh this is where we get pushed as, as music listeners so keep those suggestions coming um already you could see that this one's thrown us into a blender and um taking us outside of our comfort zones it's really cool so Keep those suggestions coming. Make sure that they have some sort of uh, linear theme. It could be as easy as they're both shoegaze bands, or they had some affinity with John F. Kennedy for like two seconds in, in their intro tracks. Like something just completely out there. Doesn't matter as long as they're linked, we'll do them. So exactly, let's do it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody, for listening. Uh, again, this has been Loveless Will Tear Us Apart. And uh, this is John Marchand. And this is Andreas Fabiakis. Take care, stay safe, and get vaccinated. Take care.